And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this gospel reading in Luke 1 probably sounds familiar to you, especially if you have been going through morning and evening prayer with us online, or if you had done morning and evening prayer on your own or, or um, sometime in the past. What we have here in, in Zechariah's prophecy, or Zechariah's song, whatever you want to call it, is, um, is the second canticle in morning prayer. Now, what is a canticle? Uh, a, a canticle, all a canticle is really, is sort of a, a biblical, um, in many cases, New Testament way of responding to the word of God that we have just read. So, so the canticle would come right after, the second canticle would come right after the second reading, uh, which is typically a, a, a New Testament or gospel reading. So we, we, we hear um, this explosion from, from, from Zechariah, and it is so profound that we put it in our liturgy to respond to God when we hear from God. And you hear about, you know, why is it in morning prayer? Well, you hear from the day spring. The day spring from on high has visited, visited us. And so the day spring, of course, is the, the break of day, the new day, the new morning. And so that's where all of that comes from. And, and, um, and, and sometimes you, you, you read this canticle or, or, you, or you use this canticle to respond and, and it says, and thou child shalt be called the prophet of the most high. It's not talking about Jesus there as we have found out in the context of this, of this uh, reading. Um, it is about John the Baptist. Um, thou child is John the Baptist, the prophet of the most high. And it's a beautiful canticle, but it usually runs number two behind the jubilate. And you can ask uh, Mr. Anderson why, um, because that was his choice, not ours. Right, so that, that was funny. I'm picking, on the, I'm picking on the music guy. He picks on me a lot. But what does it mean? What does it mean, this, this, uh, this, this explosion of praise, this, this profound and beautiful explosion of praise by Zechariah, the old man, uh, Zechariah? What, what does it mean? Um, and and to, to illustrate what, what he is talking about, I wanted to share a little bit of my own sort of personal internal struggle um, with you. And, and, and when I do things like that, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sort of up here trying to make it about me. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to connect with you. And what I'm hoping is that you will hear what I'm saying and that you will sort of free associate. Uh, you, will, you will sort of bring out the things within yourself that, um, that, that I might be talking about that, that have relevancy uh, to, to the scripture and, and to connect. Uh, um, so, so that so that we can both hear the 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 words of the gospel uh, together in our own personal wherever we are, because it's, it's it's a universal message. Now, I often wonder about myself. In particular, I often wonder um, about the extent to which I am not joyful. The extent to which I am not joyful in the Christian sense. Taking full delight in Christ, I mean. What, what, what is holding me back from full delight in Christ? You know, like everyone else here, I was raised in sort of hard-boiled in this late 20th, early 21st century world um, in a particular point in time. And the culture is embedded within me just as the culture is embedded within you, and, and it is stubbornly attached. I cannot remove it. It's just a part of, of who I am, and, and it's just the way it is. And of course, it's not all bad. This is a relatively great time in human history with all the, um, the, the medicines and the, the, the prosperity and the liberty uh, that we have. Um, this is, it is a really uh, remarkable time in, in human history. But, but, um, but, but going with that, is a bit of a cultural arrogance. There, there's a cultural arrogance to the late 20th, early 21st century West. And it's a cultural arrogance that, is, um, that, that, that takes us away from God. And it takes us towards our own reason. It takes us to our own feelings. And we sort of, we sort of use that as the center 
of everything that is right and true, our, our, our reason, our feelings, those sorts of things. And let me give you an example. So I read about the exorcisms that Jesus did, and I, and I watch them on The Chosen, which you all should be watching. Um, the, the, the show The Chosen. You should all be watching that. Next time I ask you about it, you, you should have watched it. Um, and, and it's on DVD. There's no excuse. Um, and I'm going to check up on you. Uh, so, but, uh, but, but I read about the exorcisms that Jesus did. And where does my mind go? Where does my 21st century mind go? Well, I go to this. Okay, well, that must mean schizophrenia. Um, that must mean um, bipolar disorder. Uh, that must mean something that can be explained rationally and materially. That, that, that must be what that means. Because that's where I was, that, that, that's where I was hard boiled. That's where, instead of what the gospels and what the scriptures plainly teach, that's where my mind goes. I don't know where your mind goes. Maybe, maybe I'm the one. Uh, maybe I'm the one who needs it. Um, but, 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 you know, you know uh, maybe I'm connecting. You know, what do I look forward to in life? What do I look toward in life? What do I uh, latch on to in life? I latch on to material comfort. It's comfortable. It can be comfortable, this life. Um, I latch on to my kids' success. I project myself onto my kids' success. Um, entertainment, distraction. Instead of, as Jesus said in Luke 4 when he was in the wilderness being tempted, the word of God is the bread that sustains me. See, th th these are my temptations. I worry about the opinions of people I want to identify with. I worry about the opinions of people I want to impress. You see, now um, uh, there is a Wall Street Journal article, and, and this is, and, 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 and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention this article is because, because this is this is something that is ubiquitous. It, it is um, it is all within us. It is it is um, it's not just you as the person on the street. It's not just you as the person um, down the, um, in, in the church wherever it is, Second Baptist or wherever people go. Um, it's not just me, it's my colleagues, it's not just me, it's, ev it's everybody, see. Uh, so I, I, was, I, I, I read this Wall Street Journal article from this Roman Catholic who had absolutely had it with the New York governor picking on churches. And I agree with him, frankly, um, because it, it's, 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 it's not equitable. But except for that, he wrote this scathing article, and he urged the bishops to defend the rights of churches, and I'm not against that, by the way. Um, but a good friend of mine, who was raised in a different sort of way, he didn't like the article. He comes from another cultural aisle. He cares about the opinions of the elite. He cares about the opinions of um, people who read the New York Times. Um, you know, I, on the other hand, come from a different cultural place. Um, I am more apt to want to poke the New York Times in the eye. Um, now, you, you may not be this, and I'm not trying, I'm not making any, I'm just saying this is who I am. I mean, y'all know who I am, right? I mean, I, I've talked about stuff like this. Um, and I care about other people's opinions. So, um, so it's interesting and telling to see it all as we, as we take in this word as we take in the word of God, the bread of life, and as we take it in through our different ways of seeing things and the different ways that we have been hard-boiled. And it's all, it sort of was all laid out there in black and white with me and, and, my, and my colleague. And I asked myself, is there no end to this buffer I have against God? A buffer that I have against God, so deep in a part of me. What, what part of my birthright in Christ have I traded for a bowl of porridge like Esau did? What is holding me captive? Who or where is my dissonance coming from? I would be so much happier in the full joy of Christ as we would all. So all of that is sort of a, an introduction to this text. 
Gabriel, the angel, visits Zechariah, the old man, the father of John the Baptist, and he announces a child to the man. And like Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, these were older people. These people were barren, past their birthing years. And Zechariah makes note of this to the angel's face in verse 18. He says this, and Zechariah said to the angel after the announcement, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. He is hearing the word, the announcement from an angelic being and he is still saying, I don't believe you. I can't do this. We, we are too advanced in years to do this. I don't believe you. And Gabriel says something very powerful here. Um, and, and, and it's a bit of a, re a rebuke in verse 19. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. <laughs> I am Gabriel. I'm not not Gabriel. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. If you don't know who Gabriel is, I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to you to speak this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you read that text. I am Gabriel. I stand in the place of God, in, 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 the, in, in the presence of God. Um, Zechariah, um, you know, um, you can see where I started thinking about myself and thinking about this, this, uh, this, this news. He was sent, Zechariah could not process this good news because of the limitations he saw within himself and he saw in his community and he saw in his culture. Can we relate to that? Is that something that we can look at and say, well, maybe I would have been stricken mute at that point as well. Imagine the angel in front of you. An angel's in front of you. I have great news. You will love this news I have for you, Zechariah. You will love it. Zechariah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You see, there had not been a prophet among the Jews for centuries at this time. The Jews had been under the boot of Rome for some time. They had previously been under the boot of Greece, of a particular party of Greeks. They had enough independence with the Maccabees to get a taste of independence and then lose it shortly thereafter. So, so there they are. They've been disappointed. They have been oppressed. Um, nothing is trending up. They have heard nothing from God. This could not possibly be the time that the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham and David would come about. Because of the way of Zechariah, because of the way he thought about success and what constitutes success, he could not fathom what was about to happen. And yet, because of that news that was given to him, here we are, 2,000 years later, a group of people gathering in a rainstorm. Many of you have come from a long way away celebrating. We have, do y'all understand, we have no business being together from, 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 uh, from, from, from a cognitive standpoint, from a rational standpoint. There is no reason we should be right here together today, this morning. There's no reason I should be in Texas. Yet here we are, lighting candles, celebrating something that God has done for us. And Christians on every other continent meeting and celebrating the same thing. And yet. So you might have heard my thoughts. You might have connected and thought about your thoughts and thought about your 
ways that you buffer yourself from God, from Christ. You might have looked at the story of Zechariah and you might have related to him and thought, well, gosh, you know, I can really see now why he might have been a little bit hesitant about this whole thing. And you might consider the message of Advent, waiting for the visitation of God, either in Zechariah's spot, waiting for the first coming, the incarnation. They didn't know what that would look like. They thought it was going to look like something completely different than it ended up being. But us here, we're waiting too, just like Zechariah. We're waiting. We're waiting for the second coming. We're waiting, waiting for the second visitation of God, which will be the final one, and the one where all things are all made new. And maybe you look at yourself and you wonder. You wonder what God thinks of you for your doubts, your guilt, this modern or postmodern thinking that is embedded within you that you can't seem to shake, this inability to, to access the full joy of Christ. And you might wonder, is there any hope for you this Advent? You might ask yourself, why did Zechariah go mute? Why was he able to speak again? Well, I don't think that he would be, have been capable of this eloquent praise that we say in morning prayer had no action been taken by the angel, by God. The God of grace did that to increase joy, to increase praise. You see, we don't need to forget as we find ourselves in the condition that we find ourselves. We don't need to forget the words of the angel because the words of the angel don't alter because we doubt. They don't alter because of our guilt. They don't alter because of this cultural thing embedded deep within ourselves. They don't alter. What does he say? I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. This good news. And this good news in Zechariah's words, in the Benedictus, is a light to those who sit in darkness. This word that we hear in the morning, this word that we hear in church, this word that we feel and touch and taste when we come to God's table is a light to those who sit in darkness. Even in his muteness, Zechariah's muteness, the purposes of God unfolded. The purposes of God went on. John went out as the prophet who bridged the old covenant and the new covenant to proclaim the coming of the Messiah of the Most High, to make straight the ways of the path of God. He went out regardless of Zechariah's muteness. Jesus, the object of his prophecy, went forth and did all the angels said that he would. And Zechariah's mouth was opened by the grace of God, and in that muteness he was drawn closer, even closer to God, because God had touched him. And his praise, when he opens his mouth, echoes through the millennia and echoes into eternity. In your doubts, in all of our capitulation to human thought, to rationality, to feeling, to culture, God still works. You are not frustrating his purposes. You cannot frustrate his purposes. None of what you fear about yourself before God can alter the events of the gospel. 
there is nothing you can do to unwind the events of the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was born. Jesus died on a cross. Jesus is coming to make all things new. Whether you were joyous, whether you were feeling guilty, whether you are confident in his promises, whether you feel worthless before him this morning, nothing you can do can unwind the gospel. And nothing you can do can change the fact that the gospel is for you. It is for you. Zechariah was brought closer to God because of his initial disbelief. This disbelief is a very frail and human thing. But in that frailty, he met a God who operates in mercy. A God who uses frailty. A God who uses weakness to forgive us. To justify us to bring us before the presence of God and to reconcile us, to give peace to us with God. He uses frailty and weakness. And that includes our own. You can look forward to Christmas with great hope and confidence. And you can look forward to that day that is coming sometime in the future that second coming with great hope and great confidence. For we know who will be coming. We know who's coming. And in his wings will be healing and forgiveness and mercy. Despite everything that we find ourselves embedded in this morning. Have hope. Have hope despite yourselves. Because the gospel is true. Even though we find ourselves where we are. Amen.